but distant within the linear sequence of the DNA by cross-linking the DNA and sequencing the flanks around the cross -links. And he took this method and applied it to a metagenomic community and showed that you could use it to build basically one million base pair linkage maps within an environmental community to link structure and function, and function and phylogeny in particular, within a community. So again, we're getting this mostly tiny, short read Illumina data, but now we can build scaffolds from this Illumina data of which genes go with which other genes and make better inferences about the community um, by doing this. Another approach to doing this, which people are probably more familiar with, um, many people have worked on, there's a graduate student who was in my lab, Lizzie Wilbanks, who's now a postdoc at Caltech, who was characterizing these pigberry communities, and basically what she used was these relatively new or um, relatively improving methods to sequence long reads from communities. So we used this molecular method, which is developed by a company that was then bought by Luna, which basically gets you synthetic long reads from a community by subcloning large DNA pieces and having a barcode inserted into the same um, different parts of the subclones of a single DNA fragment. And then um, we did random shotgun sequencing from these communities and also did Pacific Biosciences sequencing. And what she was able to show was that by having these long reads, what had been an incredibly messy analysis of the environmental community from the shotgun sequence data um, suddenly became a little more transparent in terms of interpreting the biology of the community. And she was able to show, for example, that there were these proteoredopsin genes, which are these light-mediated proton pumps, that appear to be linked to sulfur metabolism in one of these organisms, which had not been characterized previously. And this only was possible by linkage with these large insert DNA libraries from the environmental sample. I'm not going to tell you about this uh, other method that she used, but she's now at Caltech and Vicky Orphan's lab because Vicky Orphan is one of the people who developed this method called NanoSims, which allows you to scan through a sample with a brass ring on an ion beam, basically vaporize nanometer scale portions of your sample, feed that into a mass spec, and look at the products that come off on a nanometer scale resolution from your environmental sample. And then you can get, compare different parts of your sample with each other and get information about what metabolites or what elements are in those different parts of the sample. And that's how she was able to show which organisms in this community were doing sulfur metabolism or nitrogen metabolism by mapping uh, with this nanosynthesis method. Um, another approach to sort of what I would call better um, methods is to get better reference data for communities. So we're shotgun sequencing these communities. A lot of what we do is compare to what we call reference data, reference genomes or reference protein families, and use those comparisons and knowledge about the thing we're comparing to to make sense of this fragmentary data from a community. So for example, we need more phylogenetic markers. In our original analysis of phylogenetic markers, we found about 30 genes from across bacterial species that served as good phylogenetic markers. We've been scanning through every major lineage of bacteria and coming up with lists of phylogenetic marker genes that can tell you a lot about the diversity of those particular lineages. So for example, if you're interested in cyanobacteria in the community, we have about 600 genes from throughout the genome of cyanobacteria that can serve as a good marker for telling you what kind of organism you see in the sample. Reference genomes are really important for doing this work. When I was a tiger, um, I noticed, as did a few other people, that um, most of the genomes that were becoming available from bacteria were from just three phyla of bacteria, the low GC gram positives, also known as the firmicutes, the proteobacteria, and the high GC gram positives, also known as the actinobacteria. So we started the first project to try and correct this, funded by the NSF Tree of Life program, where at the time it seemed very dramatic. We were going to sequence eight genomes, um, one representative of each of eight phyla of bacteria for which they were cultured species and no genomes. When I moved to Davis in 2005 and got this adjunct appointment at the DOE Joint Genome Institute, we started what we called a genomic encyclopedia of bacteria and archaea, where we've been marching our way through the diversity of bacteria and archaea. Um, filling in the tree, getting genome sequences from any branch that has a cultured representative but no genome sequence starting at the base of the tree and going out so we get the most phylogenetic diversity. Um, we did a lot of analyses that I'm happy to talk to people about uh, later that showed that this was a very beneficial approach for improving your ability to annotate genomes, to annotate metagenomes, to 
discover new functional diversity. Filling in the diversity of genomes from across the tree of life is a very powerful tool. And I'm just going to give you one example of this. There was a study that got a lot of press recently of these hunter-gatherer microbiome studies where people sequenced the microbial community from the guts of uh, some people who have been relatively isolated from the rest of the world. They did shotgun sequencing and then tried to compare the genome, the, the organisms that were in these samples with organisms that were, say, from westernized populations. Um, and there were a couple of studies like this, and one of them they found a really interesting thing, which was this, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's this lineage um, that is all, all the sequences here are present from these hunter-gatherers, but not from any westernized population. And they're related to a species called Treponema succinifaciens, and then another species, Treponema, I can't even read, uh, nor do I remember what it's called, two species of spirochetes that are sequences from this community are, are enriched for spirochetes relative to westernized population. Now, it turns out, despite millions of dollars spent on sequencing reference genomes for the Human Microbiome Project, that is, organisms that were isolated from humans, that we had cultures of, that they then sequenced the genomes of. The two organisms that they were able to interpret their data with were from my genomic encyclopedia project. And that's because, of course, the Human Microbiome Project got samples from westernized populations. There were none of these in those samples. There were no our culture representatives. We sequenced these treponema genomes because they were just phylogenetically novel. But that allowed the interpretation of this metagenomic data from these samples because you had a reference that was relatively closely related to these organisms in these samples. Um, so we basically managed to convince many people that this phylogenetic approach to sequencing was useful. There's been a cyanobacterial project run at the JDI. We had a project at Davis on halophilic archaea. There have been many other such projects. It turns out these are, I think they're great. I wouldn't say they're useless, because they're very useful. But if you actually look at the diversity of life, um, and you look at all the ribosome RNA sequences that we have from both cultured organisms and uncultured organisms, almost all of the evolutionary diversity of life is from uncultured organisms. So we're trying to characterize the genomic diversity of life by marching our way through the cultured diversity of organisms. It's like one-tenth of half a percent of the total diversity of life. And so there's a new effort at the Joint Genome Institute and now at a variety of other groups to go through uncultured lineages and sequence genomes from those branches and get reference genomes and functional information and other data from those lineages to much more broadly characterize the diversity of life. One of the projects was called the, the Dark Matter Project. Apologize to the physicists out there out here. Um, run by Tony Wojtke at the JGI. We have a new collaboration with Ramunas Stepanoskis at the Bigelow Labs to do the same thing. There are many approaches whereby you can get genomes from uncultured organisms. What we're doing here is single cell genomics, flow filtering cells, running whole genome amplification, and then sequencing the genomes. Um, Jill Banfield at Berkeley has shown an alternative approach that works really well, which is she's and her group has gotten incredibly good at actually assembling genomes from random shotgun sequencing from samples. And assembling, they just had a paper with 200 new genomes from phylogenetically novel lineages assembled by ran from random shotgun sequencing. But we need many of these projects, the total diversity of life that we understand now, we probably need about 500,000 genomes to characterize half of the currently known phylogenetic diversity of bacteria. And every week, that currently known phylogenetic diversity of bacteria goes up. So um, I, don't, I don't know where this is going yet. We don't know where it's going to end. There's a lot of diversity out there, so we need projects like this to really fill in the diversity. We need the same approach to understanding protein family diversity. Go through all the genomes, sort them, build them into protein families, make reference data like alignments and hidden markup models and trees and motifs for those to then predict functions from communities using any type of approach, again, I would approve of the phylogenetic approach, but um, we need to do that. Um, I haven't really talked about particular systems much here. About half of the work in my lab is on model systems and characterizing the microbes in those model systems to try and understand the structure and function of those microbial communities. Um, we started with very simple systems, so single symbionts living inside hosts. 
We've actually been sequencing the genomes of those chemosynthetic symbionts with my undergraduate advisor, Colin Kavanaugh. Um, we graduated uh, in collaboration with Nancy Grant to two symbionts living inside a host. Um, it turned out to be incredibly hard to use random shotgun sequencing to interpret the community where there were just three players in the community, host and two symbionts. Uh, it's really hard to characterize a human-associated gut sample with thousands of species, but we're building up to that. So we've been working on what I would call simpler systems where we have good genetic tools in the host or good ways to manipulate the host communities on the Drosophila microbiome, on the rice microbiome, on the corn microbiome, and basically using the power of genetics of these organisms, the power of all the tools that are available of these organisms, and then treating the microbiome as a trait, just like you would trait, treat yield or wing shape or leaf morphology, et cetera, and trying to understand the interaction between the microbial communities and the hosts by leveraging all that we understand about the hosts. And that, in turn, allows us to test our methods. Because if we can't get the methods to work in these situations where, for example, we have rice plants growing in the exact same soil, the exact same genotype, the exact same time point sample, how are we going to characterize human population variation? And then um, another area that I think is really important, which we are just starting to get at um, in my laboratory, and a variety of other people are sort of doing similar things, is to think about the entire system. So if we think about the people in this room, I can go and collect a sample from the people in the room, characterize the microbial community in a variety of ways, and still bang my head against the wall. Because that isn't characterizing where they got their microbes from. We get our microbes from the air, from our water, from the food we eat, from our pets, from our buildings, from our mother during birth, from our family during growth. Understanding that entire ecosystem is critical for understanding the impact of microbes on particular hosts. So we need to really understand the inputs and outputs and the entire community if we think we're going to understand um, the ecosystem of microbes that live in on particular organisms. Um, one last thing I want to mention in terms of understanding these communities and the entire system is um, so what I just mentioned about people is short-term uh, interactions of people. There's also the long-term interactions. So understanding the evolutionary history and the co-evolution of hosts and their communities is really critical. That example I showed before of the treponema, the spirochete and the hunter-gatherers, is one approach that people are using. We're basically trying to do the same type of approach, look at the evolutionary diversity of a group of organisms, look at their microbiomes, use evolutionary reconstruction methods to infer what the ancestral character states were for the microbiomes and then infer how the microbiomes have changed over time in these different lineages. And in turn, try and associate those changes with environmental changes or genetic changes or other types of changes that occur in those organisms. We're doing this, for example, as a grad student working on cichlids, a great model system for diversification of organisms. Um, that seems to be one of the best for looking at host micro uh, co evolution. Um, and then uh, just a, I want to end by talking about this other side of things which I haven't talked about a lot, which is the public understanding. So when we want to study the science of all these communities, and I would argue it's, it's very complicated, um, there's lots of uh, reasons why we don't engage the public. Um, one of them is this germophobia, you know, why are we putting antimicrobial compounds in every single thing on the planet? That seems to be a bad idea. Why are probiotics selling even though there's virtually no evidence that most of them work? Um, and, and so on. So we've spent a lot of time trying to work on um, what I would call outreach and education, both first to other fields, so microbial diversity. We have a project funded by the Sloan Foundation to work with building scientists to try and improve the understanding of the microbial ecology of the built environment. And to do that, we have to engage engineers, and architects and building scientists and others because they're the people actually doing the work in these communities that we want to layer a microbial study onto. Um, we do a variety of other things, as you've heard. I spend a lot of time blogging. Uh, postdoc in my lab built something called the Microbiome Game. Uh, you can download this for free, of course, because it's um, delusional. Um, and uh, um, you can please play it. It's, it's actually quite entertaining. And then the last thing I want to end with is this new area, which I think is critically important.
important for public understanding and outreach, which is what many people call citizen science. You could also call this participatory science. And this is going beyond the practitioners. So, you know, building scientists is one thing. They're thinking about the design of buildings and, you know, adding a microbial layer onto some of their work is, you know, foreign language maybe to some of them, but is, you know, probably can get them to do. What we really want to do is engage the broader public with an understanding of microbes. And the way we've been doing this is this participatory science. We ran um, what was the first meeting on citizen microbiology here at UC Davis um, a few years ago. And as part of that meeting, we invited all the people that we could find doing citizen microbiology projects around the country, around the world. Basically, there were maybe 10 of those at the time. Um, there are now probably hundreds of citizen microbiology projects that are going on. Uh, across the world. Here are some examples. So I'm on the, full disclosure, I'm on the Scientific Advisory Board of Ubiome, which is one of these places that will allow you to send in a poop sample or a tooth scraping and get data on your microbiome back. There's a comparable project called the American Gut. There are probably 10 of these home human microbiome projects.